Within the greater gacha gaming community, there's a belief that's been proven time after time that any character given to you at the start of the game is mediocre. Perhaps not in the sense that they're unusable and will offer you no benefit, but when compared to other units, notably those who can only be obtained via the game's respective gacha systems, they typically rank among the bottom half of the cast, with it not being uncommon for them to perform even worse as time goes on. The obvious reason behind this is necessity. If your starting party ends up being a powerful and efficient lineup, the number of reasons to pull for new characters will decrease, going against the profit model of gacha games being that of collection and fear of missing out. It would be counterintuitive to make your starter Pokemon so to speak as strong or stronger than units who cost money. No pragmatic individual will feel compelled to spend money on the game, so historically everyone's been quick to discard their initial characters in favor of more powerful ones down the road, making it all the more surprising to find out that such is not the case for Wuthering Waves' Rover, who has proven very quickly to not only be a viable contender for investment, but possibly one of the strongest units in the game. I know it's a bit premature of me to make a why no one slash everyone plays episode when the game hasn't even been out for a month yet, but in light of how exceptional they are on a literal level, it's probably fine. Besides, I'm more of a discussion video essay channel, not a guide one anyway, you guys know that by now. May I present to you the first why everyone plays episode for Wuthering Waves, featuring Rover. Before we get started, I want to give a big shout out to our sponsor for today, Reverse 1999. You may have heard of it before, it came out back in late 2023, and it's one of the higher quality gacha games out there. Reverse 1999 is a turn-based tactical RPG set in 1999, if it wasn't obvious, which happens to be the year I was born. It's based around a card system where inside cards comprise your party's various actions, also known as incantations. You essentially want to combine cards together for more impactful actions per turn, meanwhile tracking what enemies will be doing based on the cards above their head. Just recently they launched their half year anniversary coinciding with their 1.6 update, Notes on Shuori. In celebration, they're giving away up to 90 pulls with new players being able to obtain their first 6 star character within 30. During the event period, you can also get your hands on the new feature 6 star units, Tionansu and Gechan. Sorry for my poor pronunciation, I'm not very good with tones. The former in particular happens to be one of the strongest reality units in the game, so definitely try to get your hands on her. In addition, you can grab a free skin for Anan Lee, and of course, there will be tons of content and rewards for you to check out during this time. If you had your eye on this game but weren't sure if you should play it, now's the best time to try it out, so download Reverse 1999 using my link in the description below. By signing in, you also get 20 free summons and 10 time limited summons to boot. Thanks again to Bluepuck for sponsoring the video, but for now, let's get back into it. Personality-wise, I'm gonna be real with you, I find Rover to be the least interesting MC I've ever seen in a while. It might just be because they came off Honkai Star Rail, where you can make the Trailblazer behave like a terminally online Reddit degenerate, but I mean, hey, at least Rover actually talks. Then again, sometimes a plain looking and behaving protagonist is a breath of fresh air. It was the first time I chose the male one because I am a fan of his more mature looking design. All that's to say, character appeal barely if at all contributes to their widespread popularity, which means their success is primarily housed in their gameplay. As expected, the rover is capable of assimilating each of Wuthering's six elements, Aero, Electro, Fusion, Glacial, Havoc, and Spectro, with their starting element being the final one, and hazarding spoilers, their second element of choice is Havoc. It's unclear what sort of playstyle convention to infer as there's not much of a subcontext with each element, with there being no unique battle system like elemental reactions in Genshin, or class designations like erudition, harmony, abundance, and whatnot, gameplay motifs are non-existent as of right now, meaning one's theme and playstyle differs on a case-by-case -case basis. For Spectre Rover, they went for a more generalist, multifaceted character, understandable as you want them to synergize with a broad range of units. The community at large has decided they would be best suited for coordinated attacks, not unlike a sub-DPS. Havoc Rover on the other hand has a more aggressive, attack-oriented playstyle, so you can decide how you want to use them, whether a support or a damage dealer. It should go without saying that anything you get for free has an advantage over anything with a cost. Everyone has Rover, naturally meaning everyone has access to their potential. There may be units in gacha games who are strong, yes, but can be prohibitively expensive to gear up, thus diminishing their value. Again, this is normally compromised by free units not being all that good in the grand scheme of things. MCs in recent gacha games are considered 5-star characters, even though their performance does not at all match their rarity. Rover, however, may actually be deserving of that title. For one, both Spectro and Havoc Rover have proven to be incredibly useful in their own right. For the sake of this video, I want to go over each one individually, starting with Spectro Rover. As stated earlier, Spectro Rover is more of a jack-of-all-trades, attacker, controller, and support. One would expect them to therefore be a master of none, and in a technical sense that does apply to Rover. But what enables them to excel, at least right now, is both the unique attributes they have and Wuthering's universal combat systems. Let's first start with their outro skill. Outro skills play a major role in the value of a character, as swapping between units in this game represents the main focus of its advanced combat skills. Most resonators fall into different types of outro skill categories. For example, the two healers Baijia and Verena offer a small heal to their tag partner along with a damage boost of some kind. 
Then you have Sanhua, Mortify, Taoqi, and Jianxin, who boost the damage of their tag partner's basic attacks, heavy attacks, skills, and liberations respectively. Spectral Rover, however, possesses a unique outro skill, wherein they create a stasis field that slows time for all nearby enemies for 3 seconds, effectively stunning them for that time. While 3 seconds may not seem like a lot, Weathering Waves is a Twitch game, meaning it emphasizes reaction time and split-second decisions over strategy and planning. This is reinforced by the stringent need to master dodging and parrying. In essence, anything that can slow down enemy movement and give you free time to attack is absolutely massive, and they're currently the only ones with a natural skill like this. Present composition conventions for teams usually goes as follows. Your main damage dealer, the one dealing the bulk of your DPS, then a secondary damage dealer. You'll basically be swapping repeatedly between these two units for the better part of a fight, capitalizing on each of their intro and outro skills. In some cases, for the highly mechanical players out there, they might swap between three damage dealers, but that makes over its outro skill all the more beneficial to have. As combat continues to evolve and players become more adept at dodging, they'll gain further usage of outro skills on account of dodging increasing your concerto energy, which is what activates your outro skill. Fielding Spectral Rover as a secondary attacker will enhance the efficiency and windows of attack for their main damage dealer, as they can repeatedly trigger the slowing effect for your main DPS to go absolute ham on them. It's a very party agnostic ability, subsequently allowing Rover to be used with any main DPS to great effect. Like you can straight up go Spectral Rover with Verena or Baita for healing and then any on-field attacker, and you have yourself a functioning party that can handle virtually every scenario. Something else to make note of is that curiously, Rover has measurably high base stats despite being a free unit, nearly rivaling that of actual 5 stars. This will be of greater importance when I go over their Havoc version later. In line with MC units and other gadgets of this variety, you'll be able to acquire all their sequence nodes eventually, supplementing their base stats even further. The two in particular that stand out are S4 and S6, with S4 notably granting a full party regen equal to Rover's attack split across 5 seconds, provided you're adequately avoiding most of the enemy attacks. S4 Spectral Rover affords you the option of running no healers at all. You may have been aware of recent developments involving the Rejuvenating Glow Set and the Originite Weapon Sears, allowing units to give party-wide attack buffs even if they don't have a regeneration effect. With S4 unlocked, Rover can go full support by taking the Rejuvenating Glow Set and wielding the Bellborn Geochellum while still dealing good damage on the side. Basically, they can be played either for attacking or supporting purposes, and they're fairly competent all the same. For that matter, gearing up Spectral Rover is super easy, they can use all manner of Echo Sets and be useful regardless of stats thanks to their outro skill being the hallmark of their utility. Now while I spent the better part of the Spectral Rover section detailing the supportive capability, I'm by no means implying they lack offensive pressure. Thanks to how fast they can fill their Forte Gauge, you can use their empowered special attacks to deal sizable amounts of damage while at the same time possessing excellent parry ability by virtue of fast basic attack animations and a quick damaging skill. In fairness, something that should be taken into consideration though is that much of Spectral Rover's usefulness is based on the fact that 1. the end game is a far ways away and 2. we have virtually zero buffing supports at the moment. The majority of Wuthering's initial cast consists of all damage dealers or hybrids who can attack and maybe offer a shield or something on the side. The only true supports they have are Baijia and Verena, neither of which have insanely strong buffs. That being said, I still have full confidence that players will continue to play Spectral Rover for their unique utility and respectable damage output. At the very least, I don't see them falling off for a while, especially since they're free. Besides, you have every reason to invest into Rover in levels and weapons if nothing else, because even if Spectral Rover falls off, there's still Havoc Rover who most people are playing anyway. While still in very early research and exploration, Havoc Rover has established themselves as one of the strongest damage dealers in the game, to the point where it wouldn't be entirely blasphemous to say that their main competitors in terms of deployment value are Jian, Verena, and Yunlin, the running top tiers of the game. As a reminder, we're still talking about a free character. Having stated before, Havoc Rover is primarily concerned with attacking. By building up your Forte Gauge, you transform into Sephiroth with a heavy attack, causing subsequent attacks to become empowered while the Forte circuit depletes. The general idea behind Havoc Rover is that they gradually build up their strength and then unleash it before resetting back to normal and repeating the process. One thing you should note is that Havoc Rover has a comparatively longer rotation time than most other attackers. Several units have outro skills that augment your damage for long stretches of time, potentially upwards of 15 seconds. The issue is that few characters have that kind of uptime, only being able to exploit maybe just over half at best. Havoc Rover can last anywhere between 16 to 18 seconds per rotation give or take, long enough to take full advantage of Dungeon's outro skill, providing a substantial 23% Havoc deepen for 14 seconds. While it may seem counterproductive to include both Dungeon and Havoc Rover together as both of them have the capacity to stay out practically indefinitely, the sheer boost in pressure and uptime you get, especially when giving both of them the Dreamless Echo makes them currently one of the deadliest teams in the game. And there is a worthwhile incentive to use Rover as a quick swap attacker. As you can surmise, the source of Havoc Rover's success is much more straightforward. 
They do a lot of damage. All of their attacks during the one wing state have incredible scaling and fairly decent AoE coverage, enough to let them handle enemies in close proximity to one another. What really opens up their gameplay is when you get this second sequence, which is available in version 1.0. S2 refreshes their skill cooldown, meaning you can do regular skill, then go Sephiroth mode and then use their skill again, which will be empowered. I'm not going to go too into the intricacies of the combo since this is a discussion video, not a guide one, but essentially with S2 you can transform Havoc Rover into a front-loaded nuke by getting the 410 Liberation Gauge built up, then have flow intention for a bit, switch to Rover's intro with Tension's outro buff, then the intro plus regular skill will fill up the 4T Gauge and Liberation Gauge. So you have the attack, get your one wing, then recast your skill, Liberation, and Dreamless Echo all at once. From then on, you can either stay on Rover and make use of the rest of their 4T Gauge, or you can use them as a quick swapper and go back to dungeon for extra damage and a second dreamless cast. Also, Rover's outro skill creates a havoc field that deals big damage to enemies thrice over 6 seconds, so if you continuously intro, outro, intro, outro, you can keep using this field. Simply put, while Spectre Rover is all about perma slowing enemies, Havoc Rover is all about perma killing enemies. Either way, what makes them so powerful is that they can cater towards either short explosive burst rotations or long protracted fights. Having their power budget spread evenly across basic attacks, heavy attacks, resonance skill, and liberation additionally means they can be built with just about anything and supported by just about anyone. Most of the DPS units are particular with their damage. Some are for heavy attacks, others are for liberation and whatnot. Havoc Grover does a bit of everything. What I think really helps their case out is that they were actually given a proper power budget. MCs and gacha games often have serviceable kits but struggle with very low base numbers and stats. Havoc Rover actually has good stats and scaling. Like I alluded to when talking about Spectral Rover, they have base numbers on par with other 5 stars, instead of being a 5 star with a 4 star power budget. Granted, they fall short a bit, but they make up for that by having free sequences. And it also helps that cost 3 Havoc Echoes are quite abundant. And their best in slot, the Dreamless, can be grinded for non-stop. So just like Spectral Rover, Havoc Rover is very easy to gear up. One last thing I want to bring to light before wrapping up the video is that of circumstance. If we look at the big picture, Rover can and will most likely fall off. More units will come out and likely power creep both versions of Rover and maybe even their Glacial, Arrow, Fusion, or Electro variants. But what I'm trying to highlight here is that they were given a fighting chance. I'm only bringing this up as a point of reference not to start any debate or controversy, but with units like Physical Trailblazer or Animo Traveler, even with Max Idol and slash Constellations, they're still trash because their baseline is just so bad that Constellations bring them up to barely on the level of 4 stars, as if they're base 3 stars and become 4 star level with E or C6. In contrast, Rover was afforded a baseline roughly in the middle between Wuthering's 4 and 5 stars, so they're like a base 4.5 star, and to his sequences they can become 5 star level. Of course, if base 5 star units get sequences, then they reach, you know, 6 star or even 7 star level. But at the very least, Rover is competitive, which is excellent. It means that even if new units come out, whether supports or damage dealers, it will take a while before Rover gets power crept. You can get a lot out of them, as opposed to another gacha games where you ditch them right away. Wuthering Razor's combat system is designed in such a way that you can theoretically take on anything and everything with just one character. So Kuro is taking a massive risk by making Rover strong if they're sufficient enough to carry players through everything that might take away reason to pull for other DPS units, thus hurting the company's bottom line. Then again, having a strong MC can encourage players to stay in the game, opening up the possibility of them spending on units in the future, especially if they already have units who can work with them. For example, if a new unit comes out who can support Havoc Rover, you have a big incentive to pull for them, whereas people will be less inclined to pull for a character if they're missing the other half of the puzzle. Everyone has Rover, so everyone having one half of the puzzle already makes acquiring the other half of the puzzle more enticing. If there's a new Spectra DPS, suddenly S6 Spectra Rover's 20 second res reduction looks pretty dang good on them. Bottom line, the easier it is to use a character, the more tempting it is to pull for them, and by granting everyone access to a strong MC, that ironically might make future 5 stars more appealing. No one expects their starting characters to be top tier or anything, they just want them to be viable investments, since ultimately the new player experience is what determines if a player wants to stay with the game or leave it. For a player quitting the game, there's no possibility that they'll spend money, whereas for a player staying with the game, there's a non-zero chance of doing so. Bear in mind, these are just the first two elements. For all we know, even as the game power creeps, Rover can still keep up through their future variants, giving players all the more reason to invest in them. It's a very satisfying and gratifying feeling for your main character to actually be good in a gacha game for once, and that, I think, is why everyone is playing them. This is a very interesting episode to me. Usually I open up with a why no one plays in every game like they did for Genshin and Storo, but this was such a rare scenario of an MC not just being viable but potentially top tier that I think it would have been better to open with a why everyone plays. Feel free to share your thoughts on Rover in the comments down below if you agree or disagree with my points. For now though, if you enjoyed the video, it would be great if you could leave a like and subscribe. Consider following my Twitter at VarsFarm, joining my Discord server, and check out my other Wuthering Waves videos if you haven't yet. 
But till next time, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.